So this is the part I believe everyone has to understand in themselves is if we already think we're great, there's no room to grow. Right. If we already think we're the best we can be, there's no room from there. So the greatest gift we can give ourselves is to accept that we're not where we want to be yet, but we're doing really great with what we've done. And what we've done is wonderful for getting what we have. Getting what we want is a whole different game and it really requires, and this is how we get sober. You accept the fact that I'm not where I want to be. Right. Period. In addition to having long-term sobriety, my guest today is the founder of the Human Communications Institute, a leader in the personal and professional development industry. He has impacted hundreds of thousands of people across the world with his programs, books, audios, videos, and seminars. He has an unmatched natural born talent to understand the psychology of individuals, which he will pass on to you. This innate and highly attuned awareness allows him to quickly perceive what makes people make the decisions they make and what makes them do what they do. Rather than breaking down walls, he is skilled at getting people to rapidly lower resistance in themselves and others, allowing room for progress. He is the developer of human interaction technology, a powerful technology that allows people to understand unknown psychological triggers and powerful communication strategies so they can increase their charisma and influence, leaving their average life behind. The author of Average Sucks, Why You Don't Get What You Want and What to Do About It, my guest shows you how to raise your average and create the life you want, resulting in long-term sobriety, greater financial wealth, physical health, and lasting confidence in all aspects of life. My guest today is Michael Burnoff. Michael, welcome to the show. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. And, and Tim, thank you. Thank you for having me and reading this incredible bio. And I'm listening to that. I'm like, I've been up to a lot over the last couple of years. And I think everybody should walk in a room where someone reads a bio about them. I believe everybody watching has done more incredible things than they realize. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. And, and I added that your audience isn't always people that are in recovery or in nope. long-term sobriety. Nope. And I added that in because I know that about you. I appreciate that. It's funny. I'm going to start to throw that out. I had a lady that you're going to want to meet here locally. She'll be incredible for the show as well. She's a professional golfer, one of the better golfers in Arizona. And she's been sober since she's 19. She's not 19 anymore. And the other day I called her out. I said, not going to mention her name because we'll talk about it later. We'll just call her uh, Tori. And uh, cause that's her name. And I said, how come you never mention that you have been sober? You have kids almost the age of when you got sober. How come you don't mention it? She goes, I never thought anybody wanted to know. And I'm like, do you understand the power you offer people, the, the leadership that we can offer people when we share that with them? So thank you for reminding me. I'm adding that to my bio. Okay, awesome. I think you should. I think it's important. It's impactful. And one of the things that you said at your event, we'll talk about your event. I went to your event a few weeks ago, and I noticed you talk about sobriety. And you talk about you talk about why you got sober, yep. and how you got sober, and yep. And there were a lot of people that are that are clean and sober that are at your event. And it was one of the things that's that's talked about. So we'll we'll kind of touch on that a little love bit that. later in the show. I'd, okay. lo I'd love that. So let's dig into it. Tell me about your upbringing. Where were you born? Did you have siblings? Yeah, good, good question. What was it like being a, being a kid as Michael Burnoff? Yeah, it's interesting. I was probably outside of like me being tall, like I was probably the most like average kid in the world. I grew up in like middle class generation X. New Jersey in the middle of the late mid to late seventies. And, and uh, grew up, I've got a, a sister who lives now, followed me out to Arizona, lives in Ahwatukee. I live in Scottsdale. My parents are out here now. So I guess I'm a leader because they left the cold and got out here. And I grew up in a, you know, I, I, honestly, a really very good household. Like I have parents that work, they love each other, married over 50 years now. And I always wanted more, but I'm one of these people that lived in like a very safe, interesting neighborhood that I don't think they make these anymore. Like I lived where everybody was about the same kind of person. I grew up in this little, this little Jewish, Italian, Irish neighborhood in New Jersey. It looked somewhere between the Sopranos and uh, the Sopranos and like everybody loves Raymond. That was like the neighborhood. Right. And everybody was like, you know, had about the same people stayed together. We worked together as a team. And what was interesting was a blessing, like having that community. But what was fascinating is I'd see all this stuff on TV with these people, with these great things, and nobody in my area had them. So I had no idea how to get them. 
but that was that was my life as a kid, man. I grew up a very average life with really big desires inside and no idea how to get them. Okay. And then what? And then I, and then this is interesting, right? So this is a talk about a story, right? So when you're not great at something you find, I've never talked about this before. So let's just get at it. Right. Okay. So when you're not great at something in life, like I was very average in sports. I talk about it in my book. I, I no one ever mentored me to be great. So I found something I was really, really good at. And I found a way to, to make fake IDs as a kid. So I controlled the liquor trade in high school, literally like controlled it. Like if you wanted booze, you went through me and I was really good at drinking. I was really good at buying alcohol for kids. I was really good. Like I was taller. So with a fake ID and being about six foot two, when you're 16 years old, you could walk right into the liquor store. Even security guards and police officers sometimes helped me fill the car with them. So prom weekend, I was your guy. So I wasn't great at hockey. But I was really great at getting alcohol and drinking, which is very interesting, right? So my parents, because I wasn't good at school, I had that ADD thing. They hired this crazy guidance counselor. I call her crazy because for three grand, I think she made a mistake. And she found me the perfect college for people with ADD. It was University of Arizona, right? <laughs> and the, she messed up on the application and sent me to Arizona State University. So instead oh. of like a place for ADD, they sent me to the party capital of the world. So... When I got out of the box I was in, I met all these wealthy, successful kids who had parents that were, they weren't wealthy and successful, the parents were. And I never met people like this in my life. So the first introduction to like highly functioning, successful people with children of like really wealthy people who didn't want to pay for their kids to go to like this Ivy League school, sent them to ASU. So in the 90s, I went to ASU and that's how I got out of where I was at. And I had no idea until my junior year that this lady sent me to the wrong college. So that's how literally I got to Arizona and I can pick it up from there. But that's, it was interesting. I never thought about that till right now. Like I was never really good at a lot of things, but I found something drinking. I was great at it and I could drink a lot and I could be fun and I could be a party guy. And like, I found my identity through, I'm the guy who knew where the party was. Okay. And you ended up at ASU instead of U of A. Yep. Yep. And because I failed out my second year, I went to Mesa Community College and I took a class in business from a guy and he goes, you can read any book you want on this list. And it was like reading about capitalism, reading about reading about like all kinds of books, like like from the presidents and all kinds of stuff. And then I found this one book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, 19 years old, single guy. There are girls. If I can influence them, this is going to be great. So I found that book and never in my life did I know that there were books out there that could teach you how to be influential? I thought you either had it or you didn't. And I had no idea. So that failing out of ASU for two, after two, not failing out, but being on academic probation, being forced to get a job and go to community college really changed my life. And that one teacher, I think it was Professor Metz. I can't remember. I believe it was recommended one book and like instantly the lights went on and I'm like, wait a second, you can get better at things. And that that started my journey of personal development at 19. Didn't know it then, but that really started my journey. Would you say that you were good at influencing people before you read that book? I was really good at influencing myself. I was really good at talking. I was an introvert as a kid. I had to force myself out of that. Like, and I don't mean like introvert, extrovert, like we talk about a genius, like I'm introverted because I need energy. I mean, like literally, I was the dude that had to wait outside of a party about hours right like i would sit out there my parents would drop me off i'd sit out there i'd wait i'd wait i'd wait take a deep breath and i was like this until i was in my 30s where it took me a minute to like walk into the room and have the confidence to walk in for whatever reason i can't i, I don't want to track back why but you see me now it doesn't look like that but i literally i remember like messing up a guy's surprise party i waited out so long the guy whose party it was for uh-huh. was waiting outside like that's how bad it was like i now i don't have it at all but i i literally was very, very insecure, but I was good with people when I was bullshitting. I learned how to influence for real, not make up a story of who I thought I was. Now, once, so you, so you read this book, how to win friends and influence people. Mm -hmm. And like, that was, would you consider that the turning point for you? No, I consider that a spark moment. We're like, Oh, okay. Like, like squirrel, like, like it was just, it was just a thing. Like they align one thing adds to another. And then I got into business for myself and I was atrocious at success. I was really good at, I could sell people, I could get people to buy something, but I really wasn't consistent and I was, didn't know how to do it. So I failed miserably in business when I first started. And then I realized 
I met a guy who got me into real personal development and realizing I was my own challenge. And I started getting into books and reading. And this gentleman up here, his name is Jim Rohn, met me at 20, 21 years old. I met Jim. He's the guy that Tony Robbins used to work for him back in the day. He's the guy that he was Earl Nightingale's buddy, Zig Ziglar. And he saw a little potential in me and, and pulled me aside and started mentoring me. And for about a decade until he passed, I would literally listen to, still to this day, 30, 40, 50 minutes a day or a week of his material. And he's the one that got me to realize that if you want things to change, you need to change. If you want things to be better, you need to get better. And the greatest value in life is not what you get, it's what you become. So he got me to realize I cannot be me and get what I want. I need to be all of me. So that's when the light bulb started going on. Personal development and books and tapes became my drug. And I got obsessed. It's an inside job. Yeah, massively. It's like becoming responsible versus becoming being a victim. Yep. Yep. And I, and I, I didn't have like, I wasn't walking around like there's a problem. I'm like, I'm thinking, what, what's wrong with me? Do I need to get, but what are they doing that I'm not doing? Well, I'm willing to work hard. Like mine was not, I'm a loser. Mine was like, I'm freaking working 50, 60, 70 hours a week. My right. brain hurts. I'm making so many calls. What the hell are they doing that I'm not? And I was looking for literally outside answers. I was looking for scripts. I was looking for people. I was looking for mentors, but then I realized I was unmentorable. Like I didn't know how to let them help me. That was my challenge. Was it because you, you didn't take suggestions? You didn't listen? You had ADD? You had other ideas? I, okay. So I would say I thought what I was doing was what they were doing, but it wasn't. It's like, I can drive my car really fast, but what they do at the Indy 500 is not what I'm doing. I fell in the category that I thought what I was doing was what they were doing. So how did you learn how to become aware? Good question. And I don't think I've ever been asked that before. So let me come up with what I believe is the answer. I believe I finally got to a point. It was it's just a guy named Jeff years ago. He, the guy's been sober now about 40 years. And this guy, Jeff, he was at one of his events and he was telling a story about surrender. I know that's a big part of the program is surrendering and, and just, you can't do it all yourself. You know what I'm saying? And I remember being at the airport once listening to an audio on a tape player this guy had, and he's telling a story how he surrendered. And I literally said, I give up. I stopped fighting. And I, I remember, I remember it was 2004. I'm at the airport and literally I felt the chills go through my body. I said, I surrender. I give up. I am not going to try to figure this out myself. I'm going to let it happen. I, I I'm getting the chills even thinking about it right now, but I literally said, I surrender. I give up. I'm not, I don't need to fight this anymore. I'm not going to fight for what I want. I'm going to go get what I want. And in that moment, it was a big aha for me. I remember getting on the plane, going back to Arizona and the things started to align for me in a big way. Like people started to show up, things started to happen. So I stopped trying to fight for what I wanted and I started really working hard for what I wanted. And I realized I was fighting a lot of my life, trying to get it, figure it out, make it happen, push. And then I started saying, you know what? I'm going to work hard. I'm going to, I'm going to do what I need to do. And more importantly, I'm, yeah, I'm not going to fight this anymore because I was fighting me. This is interesting. I don't usually talk about this and I love this. This is great. Yeah. Yeah. As one of the things I heard you say is it, it, one of your questions is what do you want? Yep. It, the question is not what do you want? The question is what do you choose? Yep. Yep. You have to have the awareness to make the right choices. Once you have the awareness, then you make the choices. Then your life looks the way that you want it to look. Yes. And I was choosing to be, use my life as an example of a guy that worked really hard, that was fighting instead of using my life as an example of somebody that is, I talked about this morning on a leadership training that is effective. And I was more interested in being powerful because I felt insecure inside versus being an effective human being. Now I'd rather just be effective. I don't, I'm powerful because I'm effective. And I believe that that's a big challenge for people. People a lot of times want to be powerful because they were bullied. They want to be powerful because they didn't feel strong. I was looking to be powerful and perfect versus being an effective human being and being an example. Tell me about your sobriety. When yep. did you get sober? Why did you decide to get sober? Yeah, this is interesting. I, I didn't have like, I would turn it on and turn it off. I was a, what you would call like, I would call a functioning choosing drinker who drank when he wanted to a lot and didn't drink when he didn't drink, but then drank a lot when he drank. It was very, if they were to put them in categories, if I went, I went. Does that make sense? If I wasn't interested in it, I didn't do it. 
I remember exactly the day. It was, I was at the Princess Hotel, New Year's Eve, December 31st, about 1030 at night, 2016. And I'm out with a bunch of friends and I, we've been drinking for hours and we had sake and wine and everything. And I had a driver and I was going to be fine, responsible. The kids were taken care of. There was nothing going on. And I looked around the room and I said to myself, what the hell am I doing? I don't even want to be doing this. Like, I don't even want to be here right now. Like, I don't, what am I doing? And I stopped. And this is very interesting. And I started thinking to myself and I said, there's a lot of people out there that come to me for advice. I was not hiding that I was drinking or not drinking. I didn't have a major issue with it. I think all people say that. Um, but I was being a very, very poor example to other people. And these words just come came to me at that moment. And I said, I'm not accepting the power of my own influence. I am, people ask me all the time, Michael, how do you talk for so long? How do you help people? What kind of socks do you wear? I pull up my tea, like what kind of tea are you drinking? And I'm out to dinner with my wife one night and I got a beautiful bottle of wine and we're drinking and people are zooming in the picture, probably checking what kind of bottle. And I realize how many clients that I have have issues with drugs, with alcohol, with all kinds of addictions. Why would I want, if people look up to all of us, you, me, everyone, why would I want to ever get anyone started? So I realized, one, I didn't want to wake up tired anymore. I was exhausted. I didn't enjoy the way I felt. I didn't like it. I didn't really need it. I had enough energy and I felt good about myself without it. But why would I ever want to get someone started? Or why would I want to give anyone permission? Or why would I want to be ever part of anybody else's issue? So I just said that night, I'm done enabling myself, but I don't want to be responsible ever for someone saying, you know what? I want to be like Michael. I'm going to drink. Or I'm going to be like Michael and it's no big deal every once in a while. So I just cut it off completely. And those are the words that I use from this day forward. I accept the power of my own influence. I believe all of us are influential people. And I believe even the greatest introvert in the world, if you're overweight, you walk the world, you're letting people know you have permission to be overweight. If you smoke, you're telling people it's okay to smoke. If you play small and you don't play big in life, you're giving people permission. So I worked for me, got leverage over myself. I did not want to be one of those people that gave other people permission to get started. So I don't know if you ever heard that before, but that was for me. I did it for them and me combined, not just for me. And did you ever struggle to stay sober? Did you ever want to go back? Did you, do you ever want to have a glass of wine? Do you ever, do you ever miss it? The, the first six months, it was always like, and especially when you got a friend, like we know some of these people we're friends with that drink like really good wine, right? Like they drink really good wine. So I'd be out to dinner and I remember being out with our friend Tucker and Tucker said, he's like, Hey, do you want any? And I'm like, yeah, you know, and he's like, dude, just don't have any. And then he said it to me and I'm like, and I was like three weeks in, I'm like, you know what? You're right. So I just, he's a pain in the, I love him. Do you know what I'm saying? Tucker Max. So he's yeah. like, don't even bother. Do you know what I mean? Saying like, just don't have it. Save more for us. So I just skipped it. And the first six months, it was like, it was socially there. Now it's funny. Almost everybody I go out with doesn't have it. Like, I mean, my big addiction now would be like, I have a ginger beer every once in a while, which is not even beer. It's like a ginger ale. And I'll order that like, oh my God, I'm a bad guy. I had sugar today. Right. So I would say for the first six months, but I also tied it to something else, Tim. I realized I really used leverage on myself. I kept on reminding myself how wonderful it was to drive home and not have to worry about looking in the rearview mirror. How great is that? Do you love that? Amazing. I never have to worry about getting a DUI. Like I almost like don't want to want to get pulled over, but it's almost like I would love to give the cop or the officer a gift and say, you got me, the sober guy. Maybe 25 years ago, you would have had me, right? But- yeah. Thank you. Give him a hug and say, thank you. But I don't really want that. But the other, other thing is I wake up in the morning and I'm not tired. I believe I'm doing something wonderful for my body. I believe all those studies that a drink a day is good for you is bullshit. Do you know, like that's just bullshit. That's right. come on Napa Valley promoted bullshit. Does that make sense? Like that's bullshit. But I, I love, I love it in the morning. So I, I did multiple things. So one is because of what I do professionally helping people, I didn't want to hurt anybody. Number two, I didn't want to harm myself and not have energy. And then I look at my kids. I can't look my kids in the eyes and tell them not to if I'm going to. So that's my deal. What, what do you think has the, been the biggest positive impact to stopping drinking? Mm. Energy and learning how to use the own drugs in my own head mm -hmm. and not needing anything, an outside resource. So we become very powerful. So when you drink, you never learn how to use your own biochemistry. 
And what happens is then it's because you just, it happens for you. You get like, because you and I both know a rum high is different than Jack Daniels. Mm -hmm. Weed is different than a beer. You know what I'm saying? Cocaine is different. Every one of these things is different than something else. Like we get a different high. So like each of our parts. So learning how to use your own neuro pathways inside of your brain, your own chemistry. So I think that's been a really big win. Like learning how to turn on this, turn on that. Like I'm able to, like I walked into this, this podcast two minutes ago, like right, right before, before we had the tech thing, we walked in two minutes. I just shift gears and go boom. Other people need a drink for that. I I just need to just turn it on. So that's been a big win. So I went to your core event not long ago, a few weeks ago, and there were quite a few people that were there that were in recovery, long term recovery. They just gotten sober. Why, why do you think people that are in recovery are attracted to you? Um, because a couple of reasons. Number one is I'm going to help them and I'm not going to put up with their story. So I believe everybody in recovery needs somebody that's going to hold them accountable because and not take their shit and see right through them. So people that are not ready to get sober, a lot of times are very scared of me. I see them. They don't want to hear from me. They don't like, you remember these people? Like uh-huh. they, they avoid, they, they smell it. They know. But people that are very serious about the recovery know that I'm not going to put up with their crap. That's one thing. Number two, number two is that I truly believe that there's a path past even recovery, which is believing that, I don't want to say past recovery is the wrong word. I believe there's a path that we get to a point and we learn how to live differently. And I offer them a solution on living even more different than, than what recovery offers them. So they get sober, they get recovery, they're proud of themselves, they feel great. And then we help them rebuild how they do their life on top of recovery. So it's like recovery and a rebuild all at the same time. So they're very attracted to taking the gift they're getting from recovery and attach it to rebuilding how they do their life. I've heard you say that anybody can be successful regardless of their connections, socioeconomic status, education, et cetera. What what do you mean by that? I mean, anybody, if they... I believe anybody can make, listen, let's get clear on something. There are certain restrictions we have as people based on just certain things. Like I'm going to recommend, I would not be the best guy to try. I'm six foot seven to go in crawl spaces under houses. I probably could figure out how to do it. It wouldn't be recommended, right? You probably want certain things we have. What I mean by that is if you want to be successful, it all depends on what your definition of success truly is. And we start there. We figure out like what someone's actual definition of success truly is. And a lot of us, we have to really ask ourselves, like, are we willing to pay the price for the thing that we want? So the answer is, I truly believe you can have what you want. You also need to know the price tag on the item that you want. And I don't mean physically buying something. So somebody tells me they want to be the greatest speaker in the world. I say, okay, totally doable. I I believe that you totally have what's capable of doing that. No harm, no foul. You, You can do it. My question is, do you understand the price tag involved? And they're going to say, well, what do you mean? Well, the thing is, you're going to have to get better than you currently are, which means you personally are going to have to grow. So I truly think, like I say all the time to people, how tall are you, Tim? 5'9". Okay, so you're 5'9". How, in the capacity of what you do, how much of your 5'9 have you used based on what Tim's capable of? All of it. So you're totally maxed out? I believe so. Okay, so the way I like to look at it is... I believe, like, let's say I'm six, seven. I believe I've only played about five, nine, five, eight, Mm -hmm. which means I've got a foot to grow. So if you believe you're done and you've done it all, then you have no room to grow. So my question is now that I ask you the question that way, do you believe that there's a whole nother level of Tim inside before you leave this earth? Of course, absolutely. And I was thinking about the question wrong. And as I'm answering, I'm like, oh yeah, I use all of my height. However, there's always more. There's always more. My capacity is always bigger. My capacity is always bigger. So there's, I, I, I'm going to continue learning. I'm going to continue growing. I'm going to continue expanding my comfort zone in every single area of my life. Physically, I'm five nine. I'm never going to get taller than five yeah. nine. I've jumped as high as I, I mean, maybe I can. I, I but can have you it. used all of your five nine yet to its capacity? And the answer I'm going to say is no, nor have I. Right. And if you believe you have, then you can't get better. Right. So this is the part I believe everyone has to understand in themselves is if we already think we're great, there's no room to grow. If we already think we're the best we can be, there's no room from there. So the greatest gift we can give ourselves is to accept that we're not where we want to be yet, but we're doing really great with what we've done. And what we've done is wonderful. 
for getting what we have. Getting what we want is a whole different game and it really requires, and this is how we get sober. You accept the fact that I'm not where I want to be. Right. Period. That's step one in every one of the 12 steps. I'm not where I want to be. So if you want to be more successful financially in relationships, your health, you've got to first go, I'm not where I want to be. Period. It opens up another three, four feet inside of ourselves to grow. If we say I'm where I'm supposed to be, game over. That leads to being, I guess, just staying where you are. If you Which is great. If you, it, which is okay for some people, I guess. Not for us. <laughs> no, no, no. If you, so speak to average sucks then. What does yep. that mean? Yeah, that's, that's interesting, right? So our good friend Joe would like it because average sucks does not mean exactly what it means. It means what it means. And the reason Joe, Joe Polish would say it drags people in. So people see this, like we live in, I live in Scottsdale and people will stop me and go, yo dude, man, love your license plate. Average sucks, man. I go, do you know what it means? They're like, oh yeah, man, be better than everyone. I said, no. It means you're average. And it's always funny to tell guys in Lamborghinis they're average. It's hilarious, right? So what it means is we all have an average inside of what we do. Average amount of drinks we have in a year. An average amount of money we make. An average amount of time we're intimate in a year. An average amount of money we invest every year. And it's like, if we were to call Mark Zuckerberg, who pretty much knows more about us than we do because he knows he's following us, right? And we would say, Mark, how many times do we click on things, go places, do things? There would be a spreadsheet. And if you looked at 2021, 22, 23, you'd almost have like the same data, right? So what average sucks means is human beings will never be happy as their average. They're never going to be content trying to be their best all the time or focused on their failure. What we have to learn how to do as human beings is, is to raise what our average is. So if our average is a certain amount of push-ups a day, we don't try to go be, oh, I'm going to do a thousand and burn out. We raise what our average is, which changes our automatic and our unconscious mind. So when our unconscious programming automatically does something different every day, everything changes. So when I say average sucks, it does because we live our average more than anything else. And if you can raise your average, because you're always going to have one to be the one you'd like it to be, our lives instantly get better and easier. So what, what's your take on limiting beliefs? We want to raise the average, but then we've got the limiting beliefs. How do those two play together? They play together very tightly. So limiting beliefs are very subtle, right? And you've seen this at core when I go through this to people and they're like these crazy little things we say to ourselves. So I will draw this very quickly so you can see this. Every one of us in our lives say things like never again. And we really mean it. Like I said it with drinking and I meant it. Some people say it with like, do you remember when you became an entrepreneur? You said never again and you became an entrepreneur. Do you remember that? Like there was a moment you became one. When did you become an entrepreneur? I've always been an entrepreneur. Okay, good. So a bad example. But if you've been in a relationship and got out and said never again, I'll be ever yeah. like, okay. Yeah. So we in our lives. I with, with drinking, it was never again. Okay. And you meant it, right? Yeah. And I meant it. And I can also remember being in a relationship and continuing to go back to that relationship until, and I was sitting with a therapist Richard Smith. And he said, when are you going to make the decision? Yep. And yep. Making the decision means that all of my other decisions support that decision. A hundred percent. So when you said never again, I wrote it on a piece of paper, your brain goes, great. What do you want? You're like, I want a better relationship. I want to be sober, whatever it is. So we bounce between walls of, we say never again to ourselves. What do I want? Never again. What do I want? And this is what most people do, even in sobriety. I want to be sober. I don't want to be drunk. I want to be sober. I'm stop embarrassing my family, wasting money, drinking drugs, alcohol, gambling, like whatever. Boom, boom. And what really changes our lives is when we change what's called our identity, how we see ourselves. And this is one of the big parts of recovery. And what, what you do is that you help people change their identity to believe it's possible, capable, and you give them a place to do it. But this is the benefit of what Camelback is. What I love about what you do with Camelback is it's about the people. So this is where our lives get shaped. This is what your average is. So it's our identity, the people in our lives, what we want and don't want. And this controls our average of what we do. So the decisions we make in our lives are based on the relationships we set up with the people in our lives, how we identify ourselves. I identified as a party guy. What do party guys do? They drink. Yeah. When I identify as a great speaker, you know what? You never need to get better. So our issue is less of a limiting belief 
in more in our identity of how we see ourselves and the fake ID, because remember I sold IDs, that we give to other people. So what happens is like you realize like if you're the party guy or you're the dealer or you're whatever, you're installing in somebody else a way that the relationship works. Like you and I have a peer to peer relationship where we work together, entrepreneurs, we support each other. You and I have set this up correctly. But if I'm like a needy person and I identify as a needy person and you identify as a savior and you're going to save me, now I need you, you save me. So I believe limiting beliefs is one of the words, but I believe what falls more into our lives and success is really how we identify. And the majority of us identify as a hardworking person, not as a person that's not where they want to be, that's on their way to figure it out and that is figuring it out. I have people in my office that will say to me, Tim, they'll say like, yep, you know, I'm working on it. Stop working on it. We need to stop working on it. We need to decide we're getting better. Working on it is forever. I'm getting better at this. And that language is a different identity. I am getting better at cold calls. I am getting better at saying no to people, not I'm working on saying no. Working on is nobody wants to work on anything. I'm getting better at it is the game plan. So I don't know if that answers your question, but I get excited about language. Do you, okay. So do you believe that the identity lives in your subconscious mind? What happened is one day we decided who we were. We weren't thinking. We bought into it. We sold it to other people. And to make our lives easy, our unconscious mind makes programs for us to make our lives easier. Our conscious mind is such a wonderful tool. It's wonderful because when we say we love drinking, I remember being in college going, I could never live without this. This is so great. So yeah. what I did is I made, like, I remember like, could you imagine not drinking? I remember five, that. 5 a.m. Dewey Beach, Delaware. We're waking people up. You got, my buddy goes out to pee in the street. Like that was our life. You know what I'm saying? Like that made sense. So we conditioned ourselves to believe these things. So our identity why it's so powerful, it lives in our unconscious mind, is, and I, and I know how to manipulate these things in a good way, is we built something that works for us. And Eric Berne and Games People Play, one of the best books you can get, or Scripts People Live, both are great if you've never read them. It, and I'll teach you about this when we get to HIT, is it explains how we create roles in our lives with the people in our lives so we can serve them. And then we think a lot of times when we're the problem child or we're the issue person, we're helping our moms and dads because we're giving them the way to love us. Isn't this great? I'm giving them a job. I'm giving them some purpose in life. They get to save me. And we create these roles. So it's identity and roles that a lot of us need to shift and change. Like Elon Musk took the role on of crazy genius that comes up with cool things that people buy and wealthy man. That's his identity. I, I mean, I, I remember when, when I decided to stop drinking, it's, it's I don't drink. And yep. then, and I also had a nicotine habit. I smoked and I chewed. And, and, and once I got sober, I decided no longer, I'm, no, I don't smoke. And it was, it wasn't, I'm trying to quit smoking. And it wasn't, Never work. I'm trying to stop drinking. It was always, I don't drink. And, and that's what I notice when I hear people say, yeah, I'm trying to quit. Or I'm trying to stop. That never works. No, not for anybody ever. I don't drink. Like I identify as a person that does not drink. Yes. That, but that, that works. Now you can't just look in a mirror and do affirmations and go to Sedona and go, I'm a person that doesn't drink. I'm a person that's not going to do anything. Like I said at the event, and I mean, no disrespect when I say this, that Bill W needs to scream out loud from where he's at. And he's up there and we need to scream down and go, listen, step 13 is missing. I used to live differently because I made different choices. And I truly believe step 13 is my life is different now. And I live differently and I make different choices. Not everybody gets there right away. It may take 40 or 50 years. So I would look at all the steps and I would say to myself now, step 13 is there was a time in my life that I lived differently. I don't identify with that person that used to drink anymore. I don't even know them anymore. Like I, I know that they're, I, I can show you pictures of them, but that's not Tim anymore. Am I correct? Correct. Like you don't even, like if that guy came to your house, would you even want to hang out with him? No. You'd help him, but you wouldn't want to hang out with him. Right. I think a lot of us need to recognize that we need to stop working on getting better and we need to decide that I'm in the process of this. So it, it, let, let me get back to your questions, but yes, this is exciting. So average sucks going back to your book. What yep. is the best story that you've heard from someone that was impacted by your book? 
I've had a lot of people and you know, it's a friend Andre brought him to the prison too. And that was incredible. I've had prisoners that have sent me, he works in the prisons, Andre Norman. And he's actually, I've had prisoners mail me and, and let me know that they were done and they had thought they had given up and because they had a life sentence and the book, this, this is the extreme that the book has literally, and I didn't, I, could, I got like a mail from the penitentiary. I could, didn't expect this, right? And I opened it up and Mr. Burnoff, you don't know me. I want to let you know that Andre Norman had shared my book. This will be the first time Andre hears about this. I had no chance to tell him. And when I read your book, I had realized I had done my life wrong. And then he clarified and said, let me get that straight. I didn't do my life wrong. I did my life the way that I was doing it. What your book got me to realize was I was telling a story about my life that didn't work. Now, I know I may not get out of here and I'm going to work on that every day of the week, but the biggest thing you gave me is I've redefined what I'm using my life for and I decided to be a person of influence inside of these bars that I'm in. So now he's running workout routines and teaching some of the new inmates and he's getting people out of shifting people. He told a story about how he's got a guy that I used to identify as a fighter that, was, that gave up. And so it's a whole thing. And that's for the guy's inside. But a lot of us are in the prisons of our own mind. And our good friend, Kevin Kaufman had said to me what the book did for him as he had identified for himself with health. The book's not even about health, but what he said, what the book got him to realize was he had just accepted that who he was, was as someone that was going to be overweight at some level. And he'd lost about 90 pounds from a book that has nothing to do with health. I've had people read the book and say to me that I had a guy buy a dozen of them for their kids in high school, because the opening story of the book is how I lied to myself all through high school and pretended I couldn't do things. And the biggest aha you get from the book is how many things have you been lying to yourself about that are not true in your life that weren't really lies? They were limits that you've put on yourself. So I could go on and on about people getting sober, people losing weight, people, customers. I, I had a guy take the book and leave it on his counter, a chiropractor. And he goes, dude, I really love this book. Is this how you run your practice? And he goes, yeah, I do run it as average sucks. And the guy signed it for a $30,000 consultation. He goes, I mean, I, I, the book is leading people to a different way of thinking. It's not a slogan. It's truly a way of life. So I wrote it for people with ADD. So I remember the first night when the book came out, it took me seven years to write the book. This is a funny story, right? And couldn't realize why I couldn't get the book done because I taught the material and I couldn't figure out why I couldn't get it done. And then I realized I was asking a nine-year-old boy to write the book, an insecure child that was bad at school. And one day I realized that I'm not that person anymore. I'm a 39-year-old man at the time that, that has traveled the world, has a beautiful wife, kids, every reason to do well. What can that guy do? And that guy asked for help. And I asked my wife to take the transcripts, finish the book with me. And six days later, the publisher got the book and I got the book done. It took seven, eight years to get the book done. First night it comes out, a guy finishes it. And he says to me, I love your book. It's done. What do I do next? I'm like, dude, I don't know. Like it took me eight years to read it, write it. And you read it in two hours. I'm like, read it again. And he goes, you know what I love about this book? It was written to be read. It was not written to be, it was not written to like blow your mind. It was written to be read and make an impact for people with ADD that can finish a book quickly. So I, there's a lot of stuff I can share. I'm just going to tell you, in three hours after reading it, you will understand yourself better. Okay. Does that give you the answer you wanted? Yes. And as you're talking, my ADD brain has lots of other questions. And then like, I've lost all the other questions. I'll take whatever you got. So, so we can. I tranced you. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, I, I love, I love, I love your program. So I guess, is there a question that you wanted me to ask you or that you've always wanted to be asked, but, but the interviewer never got around to it? It's a great question. I've been asked, I've been on hundreds of shows and been interviewed lots of times. And this has been a really fun, this, I don't even consider this an interview. I consider this like an open conversation amongst peers and friends. This is really wonderful. So thanks for building this space to do this. This is a question I get asked a lot, like, how oh, why'd you get started? Why do you do what you do? I get that a lot. You didn't ask me that, but people like, hey, blah, blah, blah. I think the biggest question is like, I don't know, like, what's one thing? I don't know. I've pretty much been asked all kinds of things. So I, I don't have an exact question I'd love to answer, but ask me anything and I'll answer it. What you, is there a question that you that you want to answer of all the, all the questions that you've been asked. Yeah, I do. That you think would be relevant for my audience. Great. Why did it take you so long to figure it out? 
And that is a great question. And the answer is, I didn't understand. And what I mean by I didn't understand is I didn't understand that I was creating a game for myself. And the reason it took me so long to do so many things, I realized that I was making decisions in my life based on past choices, meaning everything that I was doing was based on being 22 years old and saying, I never want to get hurt again. And then I found a way to live a life to not get hurt again. Or saying to myself things like, I can't imagine never drinking anymore. And 11 years earlier, not realizing it. So I would say biggest thing that took me so long is to recognize that I have to clean up the language, just language words that I had said to myself somewhere in the past that were controlling my future, current future and my current now. And I would believe that that is most people's biggest issue was a sentence, a phrase, a word to yourself that you said either out loud or to others that is controlling everything that you're doing. Because when you say you like drinking, you're a liar. You do not like it. You do it. You, it works kind of. And when you change the language around it, it makes things different. Like people that are addicted to food say, I love pizza. Why don't you just call it yummy and it won't be as enjoyable? It's yummy. Is very different than I love it. And I realized I'm responsible for my language. So when I took full ownership for my language, that's when things changed. I looked everywhere in life other than language. I looked for courses. I looked for people. I looked for mentors. And I never checked my own language. So I, so the, the, there's, we all have 50 to 60,000 thoughts per day, right? Yep. And I think 95% of them are subconscious. Yep. So we're programmed to live life a certain way. And let's say I'm, I'm drinking, I'm doing drugs. I mean, the, the way I live is the way that I live. And let's say I make a choice and I want to be healthy and fit. Yep. I want to be clean and sober. I want to be successful. I want to make more money, whatever. I want to change my identity. And what about the subconscious thoughts that bring us back to our old behaviors? Have you, like, how do yeah. we, how do we you, prevent the old behavior? You're going to get a whole crash course on this by next week, which I'm super excited about. And you're going to blow your mind. Okay. When, when you and I spend time together, this is the first thing we got to change. So if you say I need to get sober and you've said it three times and it hasn't worked, stop saying that shit. And the reason why is it leads to a hell hole. So when I say I need to get healthy and I've said it for five years and I don't do it, stop saying that shit. You've got to change the language. So when I said, so years ago, I'd work out all the time as a kid. And then I become an adult with kids and I'm having trouble working out. Working out to me leads to something I say I'm going to do that I'm not going to do. And just be honest. I'm going to be very honest. Working out leads to something I'm truly not going to do and I don't actually enjoy. So I'm a grown adult and I look in the mirror and I go, all right, Michael, why did you originally start working out in the first place? So we got to go back to our original reasons, right? Original reasons. And my original reason for working out was I was a 13 year old lanky little kid that wanted to play hockey, not get beat up. I wanted to impress women. And I was part of a team when I was 40 years old, impressing women's a bad idea when I'm happily married, right? It's a bad idea. Okay. Beating people up is a bad idea at 40 years old. Am I correct? And I really wasn't on a team and it didn't matter. So what I did was I gave myself a different game plan. I stopped working out and I started to train myself. It's a very different word, isn't it? I trained. Now, some people might say, well, it's a difference, just semantics. It's not. Training is working towards something. I train my body to be successful. I don't work out. For me, working out sucks is stupid and I don't want to do it. I put it in a box of something I don't go near. But I train on a regular basis. I train my body. So for a lot of us that want to get sober, stop trying to get sober. Start finding healthier ways to live. Start doing better things for your body. Start respecting yourself more. Start loving on your family in a way that they get more of you. Start showing up better. Use a different word until you find the one that works for you. And you will find one. For me, the word train works right now. If the word train, let's say I get hit by it. Like, I don't want to get hit by a train. I can put it out there. But let's say when a train set falls off a counter and I go, damn train, I might lose the word. But what's interesting about it is that's where we shift. And a lot of us need to first check our language. And what happens when someone's feeling triggered or restless, irritable, discontent? I mean, my experience, the path of least resistance is to go back to doing, even if they change their language, they're still like, 
the, right. there's the relapse, right? There's the uh, no. Yes, I know. Yes, there okay. is, unless you understand the language. So okay. are you irritable or is what you're doing not working? And we need to catch ourselves in the word. Irritable leads to the bottle, okay? Uncomfortable, nervous. So like when somebody says, God, it's really hard to get sober. I say, no, it's not. It's harder than you'd like it to be because there's skills that are missing. If it's hard, you'll never fix it. If it's harder than you'd like it to be, you got a chance to get better. So we need to catch ourselves in the language and reword things. So like, first thing we need to stop doing is stop saying, I love drinking. You know what? I do it from time to time. I do it as it's not even an escape. We got to stop calling it escape because it's not an escape. It is not an escape. What it is, is it's a form of insecurity and hiding. Correct? Right. Call it what it is. And it's an immature program that I've developed that I'm working on changing. The reason I say this is when we have time, we need to change how we view what we do. And by doing this, this is not what we do in the middle of a crisis. This is what we do while we're thinking straight, where our brain is working. So you can't sit there in the middle like somebody just died. You, things are awful. You've got a propensity to drink. That's not the minute we do it. We needed to have worked on it sooner. There's a time like even functioning alcoholics, there's a moment where they have clarity. And in those clarity moments, that's when we work with the people. It's a different working with that we need to work on. And there's different phases of this stuff. And remember, the reason people drink and the reason they do drugs, it is a very good idea based on the options presented to them, period. You might say, well, Michael, why would you tell them that? Because based on your options, feel like shit or drink, I think you should drink if that's your only two options you have. Option two, feel like shit, drink, or find a way to get stronger. Oh, I've never seen that option. Where'd that one come from? And then we could find other, or this is where call your sponsor comes in. Drink or call your sponsor. So what I'm getting at is what the programs and recovery gives people is additional options, not just drinking drugs or sex or anything else. So when people say, Michael, people shouldn't drink. Dude, you can't shame them for it. It seems like a really good idea at that moment based on the options presented, period. Yeah, if those, if those are the only options, it's like, it's the solution. Give me some other solutions. You're asking me? No, I'm just- oh, no, 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 in general. Okay, because I'm going to say- if, if people have other options, it's like, okay, well, I don't really, I really, I would rather prefer a drink because that's what I know. I know a drink is going to make me feel better. Let me try out calling my sponsor. Let me try out going to a meeting. Let me try out something different. And someone has to know that there are other options. 100, 150% outreach. Do you know what I'm saying? And, and we can even talk about outreach and outreach your arm or outreach to a person. And love and connection is going to be stronger than alcohol long-term, but short-term. It's a short-term fix because you have to understand what people are dealing with. They do not want to be doing it. It's just a natural reaction because we haven't changed the bio, the neurochemistry. So when I get people sober, I get people off drugs, drinking alcohol, I've got people off meds, everything. We like to make it really unenjoyable instead of enjoyable. So we make it painful for them. And I don't mean like painful, like they throw up when they drink. I make it hard for them to do. And what's interesting is an alcoholic typically can open up a bottle with their teeth. Do you know what I'm saying? But I promise you, if I crazy glued the bottle, and I made it really hard to open and it was annoying and frustrating, but then there was like a phone right there and with the sponsor's number and I made it impossible. We could make it really annoying. And if we actually make drink, I don't, not say, don't go glue bottles together. They'll, that's dangerous, but it's just an idea. If we make, if we change the neural pathway. So when I get people to quit smoking, they're really good at naturally doing it. So what I do is I change the hand they do it with and they're good at opening up their pack and tapping it breaking it. It's like their coffee. They're, they have a way of doing it. When you have them do it differently, it becomes annoying. And then I associate annoying to the thing that they want to stop doing. And then they actually attach annoying to it. And it's a wonderful way to get people to stop habits. Nicotine is a tough one for people. And I get a lot of people off that. Yeah. Well, I think we're coming up to the end of our time and tell me a little bit more about how people can learn more about you, more about your programs what do you want to share? How can people find out more about you and your programs? Yeah, I mean, it's a lot it's a lot of things. I mean, you, you can Google me, you can YouTube me, you can follow me online. It's Michael Burnoff, B-E-R-N-O-F-F. -F. I highly recommend if you're like, I like this guy. For 20 years, I've been offering a program called Call to Action. It's 
five days working with me. It's kind of like, I said, call your sponsor. You, you pick up the phone, you pick up the phone. I do a phone call every month. I do this really cool call. People say, why don't we use Zoom? I got a $200,000 Zoom studio down there. But the reason I use a phone is it's easy and nobody's got an excuse. Everybody's got one, right? So every month I do it, it's over the phone, it's part live and you work with me and we kick your butt and hold your hand. So if you're interested for the community, I put a little half price website up. It's calltoactiontime.com, calltoactiontime.com. It's five days working with me and kick your butt, hold your hand and learn how to use trigger words to drive you. That's perfect. That's exactly the website. You're smart. You're great at that. Call to action time.com. It's, I think it's three 99 to work with me and gives you confidence programs and stuff, but it's really designed about getting you out of your comfort zone and really learning how important your language is. And you're going to watch me work with other people. So it's like, I don't have to always talk to you. I'll work with others. And by working with others, it's going to support your goals. So it's not about sobriety. It's about living the life you truly are destined to have here on earth. Cause I truly believe that life deserves to see all of us show up. And I believe our creator, our parents, our kids, our significant others really deserve to see the best version of ourselves. And I, I believe a sober version of ourselves and a, and, and a driven version of ourselves, not a repressed version, but an express version is going to be the greatest gift that you can give while you're here on earth. And I'm excited about that. So that's the best way to do it. Either look me up online or let's jump in and have some fun together. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Michael, this has been a pleasure. Thank you so much for your time today. I appreciate you. And thanks for, thanks for being here. I really, I really appreciate you and your work you're doing in the world is, is beyond necessary. I mean, you could do a million different things, but the fact that you're using your story, your example, your resources to help other people get the peace that you are creating and have and do is, is a miracle in itself. And you're really doing like miracle work. And if you haven't owned that, take pride in that because that's what you're doing on a regular basis. So I appreciate you and taking the time with this and just been an honor to be here. Thank you. Awesome. If you found this video to be of value, be sure to like it, subscribe to our channel if you want to see more videos, leave a comment if you have a question or if you've got something to say. Camelback Recovery provides treatment services for people struggling with mental health, mental illness, addiction, alcoholism. So if you or someone you know is struggling, be sure to reach out to us. You can go to our website, camelbackrecovery.com or our information is in the comments section below. And we provide everything from detox, inpatient, outpatient treatment, sober living, recovery coaching, sober companion services. So either we'll be able to help you or we'll be able to refer you to people or treatment centers that might be a better fit. So I will see you in the next video.